Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Guys, you heard of spaghetti and meatballs? Of course you have. So I know you guys are going to have it for dinner tonight. Um, you heard of spaghetti stringing? I'll bet a lot of you haven't. We'll explain right now. Stay tuned. Good morning to everybody out there in Tennis Spin land. Morning coffee. Sponsor of the day is Mitzi Fields. Mitzi writes, your YouTube channel is my grandson Ryan and my favorite tennis channel. We love your personality and your jokes. Question, I have Head Gravity MP that has a grip size of four and a quarter. There is a two finger space when holding the racket. Is there any downsize to this size for me? Thank you. Enjoy your coffee. Oh, thank you, Mitzi. I appreciate you. Uh, I'm gonna take a slug of it right now. So what Mitzi's talking about is, you know, as I tell people, um, your grip size should be anywhere between pinkies width in between there, right? Minimum, maximum should be your index finger. Okay, so anywhere in between there works. It sounds like what Mitzi has is two fingers, which is a lot. So that's a big gap there. Um, I would say if you could downsize that grip, um, definitely try to do that maybe take the original grip off and uh, put a single over grip on uh, to see if you can downsize it a bit. If you have one grip, meaning a continental grip for everything, you're probably going to be fine because you don't have to switch so much and it's probably better for your wrist and your elbow to have a slightly larger grip anyways, if you use a continental grip. So, um, you're fine. I mean, as a child, I, at six years old, was using a 5'8 grip because back then there were no children's rackets and there was only wooden rackets like this that were half or 5'8. Like a quarter was even rare. So if you're, I mean, like I said, continental grip, you're fine. Just don't try to do too much wrist stuff with it, okay? Because it'll probably prevent you from bringing your wrist around. Okay, so I think you're okay. I think you're okay. Thank you, Mitzi and Ryan. I appreciate um, the coffee. If you want to support my Morning Cup of Joe coffee habit, network is buymeacoffee.com forward slash tennis spin thank you all in advance okay so let me get another slug of this um yeah when i was growing up it was either big grip or bigger grip there was no little grip there was no little racket um so we're going to be talking about spaghetti today not with meatballs although that's probably sounds really good for dinner right about now um, when I'm hungry. Uh, we're talking about spaghetti strings. Uh, if you've never heard of spaghetti strings, it's a stringing method that was developed in the 70s. Um, Guillermo Vilas, from what I understand, picked up a racket just like this, a Dunlop, and beat somebody with it pretty handily. And it, it was kind of a revolution back then and it eventually got banned because of the advantage you got from a stringing method isn't that crazy i tried i looked it up i read a little bit about it but it seemed like too much work for for me with my time constraints but my man the mad genius dan said he'd take it on and 
he's going to explain to you what it's all about. I've called him and he's on his way in right now. So when he comes back, we'll get right back on with you. All right, guys. So Dan, the man in the house, uh, it only takes a mad genius to try to recreate something that's like 30, 40 years old. At least. <laughs> I was reading it years ago and I'm like, I'm not doing this. That's a lot of work. So I'm glad we have Dan um, who has a lot of time on his hands and is very creative and an engineer as I call him, even though he's an HR guy by trade uh, to do this stuff. So Dan, why was it called spaghetti? Sure, so the um, original technique used some tubing uh, that resembled spaghetti uh, in, in the string design, and we'll talk about where, where that comes from in a minute. Okay, so so wet spaghetti, not dry spaghetti. Correct, it's okay. and hollow, hollow tube. Hollow tube, yeah. okay. And don't eat this. <laughs> eat the golden grain one I got. Um, so how, how did we do this, or how did you do this? Sure. So I followed, uh, in 1971, Werner Fischer was a, a German horticulturalist who um, did, filed a patent for this uh, string design. And the string design was des designed for extreme spin on the ball. And so I followed the uh, original patent design. And what it calls for is two sets of mains through, through each of the other mains, five sets of crosses, and these are double double crosses, a set of tubing at each intersection, and a cross string with knots in it. And in addition, uh, little little blobs of glue up on the top and the bottom so the whole thing doesn't slide up and down. So that's, that's the es essence of the original design. I didn't realize it was double crossed. So you got double crossed. I got double crossed. <laughs> and the unique thing about these rackets is uh, for whatever reason, these, these clashes, you can put two strings through all the mains, except for a couple at the bottom. I had to uh, open them up a little bit. Um, and and you, you can actually do a, a triple tie off over here. So these rackets uh, are unique. So basically the crosses are in between the mains because there's two sets of mains on like each hole. So the, they're, they're in the middle, so not woven through, just straight through. Correct. They're tubed so that they slide easier is my guess. Yep. And then what is this all about here? Sure, so, so the key to this design, and I don't know if you can see this, but these cross strings mean that when the ball hits the racket, all of these uh, mains move together they slide over the cross and they move together. And that's what creates so much spin on the ball. So basically you've got your trampoline effect this way on the ball, and you've got a catapult effect this way. So these all these strings move back. And when the, when the, when the ball comes off the racket, these snap back and impart basically double the spin for the same amount of head speed. So hitting with this racket is just insane. Wow, so we have the normal tubing here, the normal spaghetti, and then you used... Uh... <laughs> so, so before Harry gave me some, some good uh, tubing, I found these little spacers, and they actually work really well uh, because they're extremely slippery, um, and they really grab the ball nicely. So these, as you can see, all kind of move together uh, when you hit the ball. There's a lot of nice movement in there, and the spin generated by this. My goal is to be able to hit a ball, loop it into the court, and bounce it over the fence. And I actually did it once with this racket. So let's see what it would have looked like in 1971. By, so, so, by the way, that's the year I was born. So, so the whole thing started in 71. By 77, history has it that Ile Nastasi was a top player at the time. Most of you never heard of him. He got beat by a, a, a kind of a little known player with this, this uh, stringing method. And he swore he'd never play against anyone that used this again. But he shows up at the next tournament. What does he have under his arm? He's got a few of these. And I think this is the racket Nastasi was using. And I think if you put this spaghetti string job on it, this is something like he would have had. And he came out on the court playing, um, uh, it was the guy at the time, one of the top uh, players, Guillermo Vias, had won 53 straight matches, top in the world. And Nastasi, after two sets, Vilas walked off the court. He just walked away. And so this got banned, this string technique got banned a couple years later by the ITF. 
And they basically said every intersection had to have a weave in it. So very few people ever heard of it. It wasn't around very long, but the competitive advantage was extraordinary. And we said, we need to try this. So back in the day, 1971, um, there wasn't Western, semi-Western grips, uh, which, you know, which is kind of what's more prevalent today. Um, spin wasn't a big thing though. So what did this actually give you? So this was creating so much spin at the time. And that, you know, for example, you get on a clay court with one of these and you're basically doubling or tripling the amount of spin anyone had ever seen. And it was, you couldn't, you couldn't compete against it. Basically there was a guy who was number 200 in the world. This is in 77 who beat Stan Smith in a tournament early, maybe first round six, two, six, oh with one of these string techniques. And so eventually they banned it because it was deemed uh, too uncompetitive. Wow. Yeah. So you're making a flat ball, you know, you're adding two to three times more spin to a flat ball, essentially. So right. that's unseen spin yeah. back very, in the day. Very little effort when we, when we went out and hit with these, uh, just a normal kind of an easy loop beforehand. Uh, the ball jumps off the court so hard, it, it's almost impossible to time it. Uh, it's It's very entertaining, so. We had a lot of fun with these. Oh, interesting. So I'm glad and I thank you for engineering uh, this. Uh, we're very excited to give it a shot. All right, so Dan, if somebody wanted to actually blow four hours and do it on their own racket, um, how is this done? What tension? Sure. So the original patent called for 60 pounds of tension. And what you do is you take you take your mains and these are all these are all double double mains right so you're running the two strings through each hole two strings two strings two strings and you're double pulling them so you put both the strings in the machine to pull them each time you run it across and then your knot if you can get all four through there you can get a big knot if you can't uh, you can get one string through one hole and another string through another hole so you'll have three strings these these holes will all take two strings or three these down here have to be cut off. Okay, these grommets at the bottom, this one and the one over here to get the strings through there. Your cross strings, there's five crosses. One, two, three, four, five. These go through the mains. They're not woven. There's through the mains, through the mains. And there's these are also double strung, okay? So now you get all that done. And as, as you're pulling these strings, uh, mains through here, you got to put the tubes on each one. So you get your two strings sticking out, five, five spacers, five spacers, pull it through. So that takes some time. Okay, so now you got your, your strings and spacers. Then you've got to come with these cross strings. So this is a 100 pound polyester kite string, which is very stiff and it won't break. There's a knot at each intersection. Okay, and that's what allows these strings to move together. And then I put a super strong glue on each knot to try to hold the knots together. So that takes some time. So these may be maybe 10, 15 minutes for each of these. And there's 10 of them, five on each side. So you've got another couple hours of getting these strings uh, in here, which is critical for this movement here. And that's it, you're all done. I don't do it all at the same time or you'll go crazy. All right. <laughs> I, yeah, I probably don't have that much time to do one racket. But so you can do this for fun you can't take this on the court and play a league match with it because it's deemed to be illegal, even in like league play here, right? The USTA stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the International Tennis Federation requires that each uh, each uh, cross has a has a weave in it. So this, this is fun to play around with. It's fun to think about what would happen if they hadn't banned it, and this was legal today. And it's fun to think about what creates spin on a tennis ball. And can you use this this technique to string a racket, maybe looser on the crosses than the mains, to get more movement uh, and snap on the ball? And Alcaraz uses uh, 55 mains and, and 51 on the crosses to hopefully get more snap on it. Mm -hmm. So you can get almost as much spin out of a modern racket with the right technique. Nice. Thank you, Dan. Anytime. My man Dan, the engineering tennis man. All right. Thank you for joining us today, thank you. Dan. Thanks a lot. All right, guys, thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Coach Goo, check yeah. this out. Swing Vision.
got a new commercial out. Oh. Check out his James Blake and Roddick. Roddick. Oh, oh, my God. He's still playing? I mean, he's still playing. Whoa. 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 What? Dude. Dude. That's damn fast. I can do it. I can do it, dude. Back in the day, I could, I could do that. I could totally do that, dude. You can do that. You can do that. Let's go, man. We can show them how it's done. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All Let's right. Go. All right. All right. 85 miles per hour. That can't be right. No, that's definitely right. That's definitely right, man. 88 miles per hour. That's not a gigawatt. One more. One more. Watch me. Watch me. 78 miles per hour. Hey, man. <laughs> Something wrong with this program. Nah, that's just you, bro. L you try. You try. Right, Let's okay, see what I'll you do. It. I'll do it. You're going to go 69 right here. 127 miles per hour. You can check out your serve speed on Swing Vision 2. Doc, we got an issue.